Good morning. Say that back to me. Good morning. I just want to celebrate with you that you have survived yet another time change. Well done. You've done it. So just say to somebody around you, you're a survivor. You're a survivor. I knew you could do it. I love it. Uh, I have to say, uh, you say, it shouldn't mess us up, but it does. It does. In fact, uh, it might mess you up uh, throughout this week, but then soon, this is just the way it is. Not until October. And then uh, we'll go back again. Uh, so this is, this is fun. Uh, if I haven't met you, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Harvest, and uh, we're glad that you're here. If you're joining us online for the first time, we're glad that you're here. If you're joining us downstairs, we're glad you're here. And so I want to make sure if you're here in person uh, that you would get uh, a welcome bag. We say this every week. Why? Because it's important every week. Because we have folks that are joining us for the first time every week. We want you to get this welcome bag. Inside of it, uh, I can see just a couple of things that just meant to bless you. Uh, a book called How Good is Good Enough. That's an important question. Uh, we want you to answer that question. Even if this is your only time with us, answer that question. And then there's a letter in there uh, telling you more about what God is doing through his people here at Harvest, what he's been accomplishing, and uh, what you might expect uh, from this church. And then uh, also just to bless you, uh, there's a coffee coupon in there to one of our great local coffee shops. You say, well, I don't drink coffee. Coffee shops typically sell more than just coffee, though coffee is the mainstay. So grab that, enjoy that. Uh, we hope that uh, you love it. And then I'm going to invite you, if you have a smartphone, would you take it out? Just kind of wave it at me if you have a smartphone, and then I'll know you're ready because on that smartphone, we invite you, invite you to get the Harvest Church Sela app. That's what you type in, Harvest Church Sela. There's a lot of Harvest Churches in the world. We're Har Har Harvest Church Sela, according to the app stores. And get that app, and uh, you can fill out our connection card. That's where we go. Tom, would you do something for me? Would you grab one of those paper connection cards? It's on the side of the giving box. It should be uh, right there. Yeah, awesome. Uh, if you can see this, yeah, come on, bring it to me. That, that's so good. Uh, some of you are like, it's paper. I can't even believe it. What is this thing? All right. Listen, we'd love to connect with you. If you don't have a connection card on your phone, fill out one of these. And uh, this is where you can say, I just throw it in the giving box at the end of the time. We'd love to pray for you by name. Every week, our elders gather and pray. It's something we've done uh, the entire history of the church. We'd love for you to fill it out and we could pray for you by name. So you have two options, digital or uh, paper, uh, analog. You can have it right there, analog. I don't think that counts. I think it's just paper. All right, just paper. There you go. And then let me just touch base with you about uh, just being generous people. We've heard about the generosity of Jesus already and what we've been able to sing and what we're able to think about uh, as we open God's word today. He's a generous savior. We invite you to be generous as well. And uh, you say, well, you guys are always talking about money. We're not. Uh, but money is something that we deal with as people every single day. And your generosity fuels the mission. I'm thinking about our missionaries that are here Locally, our missionaries who are across the world from us, some of, us, some of them in very difficult places, and we'd love to support them. That happens through your generosity. We'd love for you to uh, fuel that mission. We invite you to be generous people. And so you can write a checkout, put it in a giving box on either level, or give online. And you're like, you talk about that every week, because it's important every week. So let's do this today. If you have uh, one of the, the five, the paper five, would you take that out? And if you have it on your app, it's there for you as well called announcements. And uh, we're going to just look at something here. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about is we know that this building is not ADA friendly. It's not ADA accessible. And so we are looking at starting an ADA service at our garage. That's the building behind our offices on First Street. Uh, that has, you can walk right in on the same level. There's a ramp to go to the ADA accessible bathroom, but we need hosts uh, to do that. And we'd love to train uh, a number of people to be hosts that you're saying you're hosting this week. You know what to expect. You know how to help people. You know what's happening. You know how to uh, bring the service on the screen right into the garage. 
If you're willing to do that, would you just sign up and say, I'm willing to host. I'd be willing to host. And you can email us at serve at harvestcc.com or put it on your connect card. And then I want you to uh, do something here for us as we talk about being generous people. Uh, Would you take this card? It should have been on your seat today. Uh, There's an opportunity that's happening right now uh, that we want to participate in. We believe that Jesus came to change the world. And one of the things that we want to participate in is how he might change our community. And that is to help build the Sela Natchez Food Bank. And uh, we are trying to raise, along with many others, uh, uh, enough money to build that building and then service both the Sela community, 98942, and then all the way through the Natchez community, 98908, which is gigantic. Uh, but we are saying Upper Valley, how can we help get food to those who need it? How can we do this in a greater way? And obviously as Christians, we want to meet the needs of our uh, community, both physically and meet the needs spiritually. So here's what we're asking you to do. Would you consider giving something above and beyond your normal giving above and beyond that? It's called an offering according to the scripture and give it. You can write a check out to Harvest and put Sela Food Bank on the memo line, or you can go right to their uh, uh, website here, selanachisfoodbank.org, and give there. It is tax deductible. Help us uh, uh, minister to the people of our community in a greater way. Uh, The needs are right there. Help us do that. That would be wonderful. If you have questions, you can talk to me about it. I'd love to uh, tell you more. Then a couple more things that you would look at. Kids ministry volunteer meeting. I love that we're training volunteers. That's happening on March the 27th. And then uh, girls bunco night. That's happening on the 25th. And then the gospel project for kids. We want to make sure that kids are interacting with the gospel. And what does that mean? Uh, You can see all of that uh, today. And so uh, that is the five for you. Let's go ahead and pray. We have a couple things to pray about specifically today. And so I'm going to invite you in just a moment. But as we pray, I do this each week. Uh, I ask you to raise your hand and pray with us. You say, why do you do that, Jason? Well, the scriptures tell us to lift up holy hands, which comes out of a pure heart. Jesus makes our heart pure. And so we, we are participating in that. Uh, and so I just want you to know that it's, it's not uh, something that you're, it's not a demand. It's, it's just saying participate. It also helps us not like check out while somebody is praying. Pray with me. Here's two things we're going to pray about today. A need and a praise. We're going to praise God because uh, a couple of weeks ago we had Josiah Shank, Josiah and Anna and their two little boys uh, come and be with us. And they have agreed to accept our offer to come and serve with us as the new worship director. Isn't that great? Would you just say awesome? Yeah. And so we're going to praise God for that and uh, we're going to celebrate that. And we're also going to pray specifically for one of our own people who uh, suffered a a serious heart incident this week. And that is our brother, Larry Duran. And we want to pray for Larry and his wife, Mary, as uh, they are out of town uh, when this happened. And so we want to be praying for Larry specifically in his health, praying for Mary as she tries to uh, uh, help and come alongside in the middle of this time. And so let's pray together. Would you not check out, but would you pray with me? Would you just extend a hand and we'll pray. Father in heaven, we come to you and it is only because of you, Jesus, that we can come before the throne of grace. We can come right into the presence of the father because Jesus, you made the way. And so we, we celebrate you. We tell you again how great your name is you know that and we know that and we want to honor that and so we celebrate the great name of our god we love this lord thank you that we can gather in your name thank you that we can bring everything that's on our hearts before you and you receive us we love that so today we celebrate we celebrate that the shank family is preparing even now to uh, look and to look and get ready to move to the Yakima Valley and join with us to celebrate your name, even in a greater way. Praise your name, Jesus, for that. And Lord, we come alongside our dear brother, Larry Duran, and we pray for uh, just healing for his body. We pray for Mary, give her uh, just the ability to know how to uh, meet with doctors and discuss what needs to be done. We thank you that you hear us. We thank you that you're the healer. And so, Holy Spirit, right now, as we open your word, the Bible, that you would meet us right in this place. 
I pray that you would challenge those who need to be challenged, encourage those who need to be encouraged. I pray that you would show us again what a great God we serve. All praise to the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some of you are like, how long is he going to pray? My, this, is, this is like uh, working out at the gym. And I say, hey, you didn't know your prayer life was going to be such a workout, but it is. There you go. Let's get into it this morning. Hey, let's participate together in this way. If you have a Bible, would you take it out? Let's be in God's word together. If you need a Bible, would you just raise your hand and Tom would bring you one? If you need one to keep for a friend, take for a friend, would you just let us know? We'd love to put the word of God into as many hands as we can. And we are going to the second half of your Bible today to find the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you find Romans, uh, you're almost there. 1 Corinthians, and uh, we're going to be in God's Word together today. If you're using the app, it's all there for you as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as you go there. And uh, excited for all that uh, God is going to teach us. Listen, we've been in a series called The Signature of Jesus. What does it look like? to be known for Jesus. What does the signature of Jesus on the life of every Christian look like? We've talked about repentance and forgiveness and belief. And we've talked about prayer today. The word that we really want to say is the signature of Jesus on the life of every Christ follower is the gospel. It is the gospel I love that word, and we're going to come to understand it in a greater way today. But I want to begin with uh, just maybe talking about how the gospel is supposed to be unleashed. Listen to this true story. True story is always more powerful. Hear this. Fritz Chrysler. He lived from 1875 to 1962, and he was a world famous violinist. He earned a fortune a fortune with his concerts and all of his compositions, but he generously gave most of it away. So when he discovered this beautiful, this exquisite violin that he was like, oh, I've got to have it. I've, I've, got to, I've got to have that so I can play it. When he discovered it on one of his trips, he was not able to buy it because he had given most of his fortune away. Later, having raised enough money to meet the asking price, he returned to the seller. And hoping to purchase that beautiful instrument, but to his great dismay, it had been sold to a collector. Maybe you've experienced that. It's like going to Costco. They had four of them. You said, I'll get it tomorrow. And you came back and they were gone, never to return. Now you understand what Fritz was going through. But to his great dismay, uh, dismay it had been sold. And so he decided before he left town that he would, he would go to the home, which is bold, of the new owner. And he offered to buy the violin. Would you sell it to me? Since it had been sold, maybe, you, maybe he'd sell it. Maybe he would. The collector said it had become his prized possession. And he would never sell it. Keenly disappointed, Chrysler was about to leave and he had an idea. He said, could I, could I play the instrument one more time? One more time before it's consigned to silence and you put it on display. Maybe in its case, maybe under glass. For that collector permission was granted and the great virtuoso filled the room with such heart moving music that the collector's emotions were deeply stirred here's what the collector said i have no right to keep that to myself he exclaimed it's yours take it into the world and let people hear it let people hear it so, well, what does that have to do with the gospel? It's been given to us. Yes. The good news of Jesus has been given to us, but it's not meant to be stored away, kept under glass. It's meant to be shared. And so today, as we look at the signature of Jesus, which is meant to be received as a gift, but that gift is also meant to be given repeatedly to others. We say the word gospel. And when you hear that word gospel, if you've been around the church for a time, you're like, gospel, yeah, gospel, gospel, gospel. It's an intriguing word. It's, uh, it's a word that you'd say, well, I, I'm interested. Tell me more. But let me just give you just an understanding of the gospel. Here's where the word gospel comes from. It is the Anglo-Saxon word Godspell. Good story is what it means. Good story, Godspell, good story. But it's not just a story, remember? 
Out of the Greek, it's ugelion, which is this, a present, a gift given to those, to one who bought, brought good tidings. When somebody brings you such good news, you say, I want to reward that. I want to celebrate that. I want to, I want to bless that. That's good news. And I want to give you a gift in response to that. And I thought about this good news, good news, good news. I don't know about you, but our days are filled with news, news of what's happening, but not necessarily good news. If you still get the Yakima Herald Republic, yes, it's still in print. Yes, you can buy a digital subscription to it. Uh, there's always articles every day, new articles, new articles. And you say, it's news. It's news about what happened yesterday. It's news about what happened across the world. It's news about what is going to happen. The weather this week is predicted to be, here we go. But when you receive good news, not just news, but good news, you are drawn in and you want to share it. And that leads us right into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so if you're your Bible open, I would invite you to go right to verse 1. And we're going to spend some time just in 1 Corinthians 15. Here's what it says. Now I, this is the Apostle Paul writing to these Christians, a church in Corinth that is a Greek speaking area. That is a real town. You could go to Corinth today. In fact, you could vacation in Corinth. You could go there. It's a real place. And he is writing to them. He says, I would remind you, brothers. I love that. That's a family reference. He considers them family in Jesus Christ. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. I would remind you of the good news. I would remind you of the good story I preached to you, which you received. There's something that's happening there. I gave you the gospel and you took it. I gave you this gift and you received it. In which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you. And then he gives this little tagline, which is a little bit of sarcasm, a little bit of tongue in cheek here, where he says, unless you believed it in vain, unless it's not true. And he is say, saying it is true. For I delivered to you as of first importance. And I would urge you to stop right there. And if you have the ability in your Bible to underline something, I would make sure you get that first importance. He's saying this is ultimate. This is primary. This is number one, not just number 17, not number 25. This is of first importance. Get this. Here's what he wants you to get. What I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and stop there what we're reading today is the scriptures what we're learning from today is not just story time but this is the word of god for us amen we must understand that correctly otherwise you're saying uh, it doesn't matter it does matter it mattered to the apostle paul it mattered to the Corinthians and it matters to us. This isn't just story time. This is of first importance. And each week I ask you to do some things like, hey, would you write this down? Hey, would you hold on to this? Hey, would you respond in this way? And there's some things today about the gospel, which is the signature of Jesus on the life of every Christian that you must get, hold on to, respond to. Here it is. Number one, we need... We, you and I, us, we need to be regularly reminded of the gospel. We need to be regularly reminded of the gospel. You see, why? Why? I, I understand the gospel. I've heard it. I get it. I, I don't need to be reminded. I don't think that's true. The Corinthians needed to be reminded of it, and they had received it. They needed to be reminded of it. You say, well, why is that? It is because our world is constantly clamoring for our attention we're being pulled in multiple directions we're being bombarded with information it seems especially since we have these little devices that bring so much information right into uh, right now some of you are probably going to go through the service and you're going to feel i i have this because i have uh, friends and family in the midwest they're on the eastern time zone so they're not thinking about church right now and so a lot of times when I have to come, I have to put my phone away because they want to text me and they want to tell me, hey, this is what's going on. And we're bombarded by information. 
Here's what happens in the news. A news each week. Let's talk about health. It's important. Let's talk about wealth. That's important. Let's talk about the weather. That's important. And we're trying to plan for what's going to happen, where we're going to go today, what's going to happen tomorrow. Let's be ready. Let's talk about the war. And there is war happening in our world right now. And it is in the Ukraine and it is other places as well. It's real. It's important. Let's talk about fashion. Let's talk about music. Let's talk about sports. Let's talk about science. And so we do. We talk about it. There's so many things that pull at us, try to grab our attention. And so we need regular reminders of the gospel and that we would keep the gospel, the signature of Jesus in our lives at a place of primary importance, of first importance. And so this is the apostle Paul telling people who he loves that let's go back and celebrate. Let's go back and remind one another that this is the good news. And so we can talk about a lot of things, but we must remember the good news. And I want you to remember two things about the gospel today uh, that are, are simple. The gospel, the good news about Jesus must be shared. It's not meant to be tucked away. It's not meant to be shelved. It's meant to be shared. That must be shared. And the gospel must be received. That's how it goes. You share it. You want people to respond to it. You want your friend to respond. You want your coworker. You want your spouse. You want your kids. You want your uncle who you can't stand to respond to it. You want that. You want these people that they may never respond to it, but man, they would be changed if they did. You want them to respond to it. Receive it. Jesus illustrated this truth about the gospel being shared and the gospel being received in a parable in Matthew 13. And I just want to talk about the parable for a moment. It is often called the parable of the sower. The sower, the farmer who went out to sow his seed. And you need to understand that the seed there is not, uh, it's not just something that we would grow here in the valley. It is the gospel, the good news. In fact, Matthew says it this way. It is the message of the kingdom. It is the message of the kingdom. It's good news about the kingdom of God coming into the kingdom of our world and changing people, bringing them into the kingdom. And here's this farmer. Picture him with this bag over his shoulder and the bag is filled with seed. Now, that's good. That seed is being protected in that bag, but it's not meant to stay there. The farmer reaches into the bag and his job, he has a simple job. A very clear job. He is meant to share the gospel. He's meant to share the seed. And Jesus said the farmer went out to sow his seed and he did that. He did what he was supposed to do as a farmer. And he sowed and he sowed and he sowed liberally. And he, didn't, he didn't try to conduct soil samples before he went. The farmer knew his job. His job was to get the seed into contact with the soil. And then later on, I love this when the disciples said, hmm, what was going on with that illustration? And Jesus said, let me share with you. And he tells the disciples exactly what the illustration, the parable meant. He said, the seed is the good news. He said, and some of that seed will fall on the ground and the evil one, the devil will come and try and snatch it right away. And he does that through many things, distraction, temptation, sin itself, the cares of life that he would pull that seed right away. Eat it up like birds would eat it up. Some of that seed would fall on rocky soil. And so it would fall on the soil and it would begin to spring up, but it would have no root. And so it was quickly fading. Other seed would fall among thorns and it would get choked out. And he tells us that is the cares of this world and the pursuit of riches, all the things that we clamor after, those things can cloud out or, or choke out is the right word choke out the good news but then he said you can believe this the seed will fall on good soil and when it hits that good soil it will spring up and bring a harvest a harvest it is implied in the name of this church there is a harvest that is supposed to happen in the hearts and lives of people and some of that seed would produce a crop a harvest that would be 30 times the amount of seed that was sown, 60 times amount of seed that was sown, a hundred times 
the amount of seed that was sown. And that is changed lives. See, if the seed stays in the bag and we don't share it, then we don't get to see it received and the flourishing that can happen in in people's lives. Now, I'm just going to stop right now because uh, this is one of those pieces that we have to step back. Here's what happens sometimes, especially in our Western world where we're very like, this is how we do things. This is how it goes. Uh, We are saying, oh, I'm going to do some soil samples because I don't want to waste seed on rocky soil. And I don't want to waste seed among the thorns. And I don't want to waste seed that the devil could pick up easily. And so I'm going to be very, very careful. And it sounds like you're an agronomist who is doing soil samples of people like, oh, well, I'm not sure they would respond to Jesus. I'm not sure whether their heart is ready to receive. I'm not sure. That is not your job. Your job is simply to share the gospel. Share it. Share it. And then trust Jesus that he can take care of it. He's the one who makes it grow anyway, not you. He's not, you're not the one who, who makes it happen. Jesus is. And so sometimes we spend too much time running around trying to get, see, uh, figure out the, what's happening with the soil. And the truth is you're just simply supposed to share it and people are, receive it. People receive it in this way. I want you to think about this out of first Corinthians 15. Let's go back there where the apostle Paul talks about that. The gospel has action implied in it. There's action surrounding the gospel, the good news about Jesus. There's all these action words. And he begins by saying it this way. I preached it to you. I shared it with you. And if you think you have to be some kind of orator, you don't. If you think you have to be an extrovert, you don't. Jesus loves to share the gospel through you. Simply who he's made you to be, where he's placed you to be. He simply wants you to share the gospel. You don't even have to be really great at it. You simply, in fact, uh, I've heard this called the parable of the dumb farmer that he's just just chucking the seed, just throwing it out there, just, just dispersing the seed. And you're like, you didn't even check on what kind of soil it was. And he's like, you're right. That's not my job. This is my job. I know my job. Let me do my job. We are, it doesn't take a certain kind of person to share it. Here's the apostle Paul. He said, I preached it to you. And then here's the action. And you received it like a gift in which you stand. And I love this part about this word of standing in the gospel. I I often think about Jesus that we stand on him. He's the solid rock and you can stand on him and he is firm and he is sure and, and he changes everything. But this is what That's not what the apostle Paul said. You stand in it. You become part of the story. As Jesus changes you, as Jesus works in you, you become part of the story. Jesus is changing me. He's changing me. He's continuing to do his work. Even now I stand on Jesus, the solid rock. Yes, but I also stand in the gospel. I am part of the story now. Jesus is changing me. And if he can change me, he can change you. If he can change me, he can change you. And if he can change you, he can change your neighbor and he can change your uncle and he can change your coworker and he can change the world. That's what he wants to do. Then he goes on to say this, and by which you are being saved. Did you hear that? It's, it's, it's an ongoing work, a work that is continuing. You say, wait a second, Jason, I put my faith in Jesus. I'm saved, right? Yes. And he is continuing his work. Let let, let me explain it this way. When you put your faith in Jesus, according to the scripture, you are brought from darkness to light, from death to life. You are changed. You are saved. But he doesn't stop there. Jesus doesn't end there. He continues his work as he changes you and he changes you that that is to be an ongoing work all throughout your life until ultimately when you stand in his presence and we don't know how many years we're given, but when you stand in his presence, then you will be saved, saved, being saved until we are ultimately saved, changed, being changed until we are ultimately changed. There's something exciting and action oriented about the gospel. And that's what he's saying. You're in it. You're being saved. It's happening right now. 
And as we look at this, the good news about Jesus continues to change you until you're ultimately changed. And when Jesus says, you're completed. You're complete. Just like I wanted a masterpiece. Let me give you just a couple of core elements that we see about the gospel. And you can find these elements in uh, verses 3 and 4. Here's some core things that you must know about the gospel. You've got to get it clear. It's all about Jesus. You begin with this, that Jesus truly lived. You say, well, where is that implied? Where is that said in this scripture? Because I see it begin with this in verse 3. For I deliver to you as first importance what I receive to you, that Christ died for our sins. Christ can't die for your sins if he didn't live. Jesus came into the world, took on flesh, lived the perfect life that we could not live, and then it says he died. But he didn't just die. That would be tragic. He died for our sins jesus came on a mission and he completed his mission and i love those words and we will talk more as we roll into the easter season these words it is anybody finished it's finished you're not finished you're not finished but jesus work of salvation is finished he has completed his work. He has provided the way. But then Jesus was buried for three days. And then there's this understanding that he rose again. Whew, we love to sing about it. We love to talk about it. We love to, to shout and, and tell people and say, Jesus isn't dead. We don't serve a, a martyr who is dead. We serve a savior who is alive. So would you write this down? Number two, it's important as we talk about the gospel. The resurrection that Jesus was raised from the dead is where the gospel gets really good. Now, now that might sound sacrilegious at first. Like the gospel is good and that God came from heaven to earth for us. That is good. But what gets really good is that Jesus finished his work of salvation. He was buried for three days and then he conquered death and the grave. That's really good. Amen. And there's something about that that is exciting and action-oriented, that Jesus is alive. He's no longer dead. You say, why is that such a big deal? It's a big deal because our world doesn't see that every day. Our world doesn't see it. In fact, you need to know this about 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This chapter is the most extensive treatment about the resurrection of Jesus in the entire Bible. 1 Corinthians 15 we, we got to understand the resurrection. You got to get it straight. You got to, you got to uh, embrace it. This is important. Don't just pass over it. It's not just a little part of the gospel. It's a major part of the gospel. If Jesus is still dead, we are to be pitied. If he came and simply died, but didn't raise from the dead, we are to be pitied. In fact, the apostle Paul knew this because the Greek people, Corinthians are Greeks, the Greek people, they struggled with the resurrection. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. In fact, the Bible tells us in Acts that the Apostle Paul was preaching in Athens. And some of the people there actually just laughed at him. Laughed in his face when he talked of the resurrection of the dead. You see, why would they do that? Their philosophers taught that the body was a prison for the soul. And sooner the soul was freed in death, the better off that person would be. And so the Greeks looked on the human body as a source of weakness and wickedness. And they could not conceive in their minds that a bodily resurrection was a good thing. That it could even happen. And yet Jesus rose from the dead bodily. He has a body today. And when he raises his people from the dead, we will be given new bodies like his. This is the truth of the gospel. In fact, if you look at this, verse 2, this is why he says it this way. Hold fast to the word I preach to you, the resurrection, unless you believed in vain, unless it's not true. That sarcasm where he's saying, unless it's not true, but it is, and I'll prove it to you. I'll show you. If there's no resurrection, there is no good news. In fact, I thought about this. People all over our world today, they live day in and day out, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday throughout the week, only receiving news. 
the news, the news, the news, the news. That's just how they live their lives. If there's no resurrection, there is only news. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is good news. And we are recipients of it. We have received it as a gift. And that means we get to share it as well. We're pulled right into the story. We're pulled right into the gospel. We are a part of it now. In fact, I want to just stop for a moment. In a couple of weeks, the week following Easter, we're going to have baptisms here. If you have not been baptized as a believer, put it on your connection card. Say, I want to get baptized. Because there's something about baptisms when we understand it right. It tells us the gospel. Jesus came. He lived the perfect life that we could not live. He died and was buried for three days. And then he rose again to give us new life. And when we understand what Jesus is showing in baptism. And when a person says, I believe it. I received the gospel. I'm a part of the family of God. He came into my life. I was a sinful person. He took away my sins. That old me is dead and gone. And I am alive because of Jesus. There is good news. There is good news. So if you want to get baptized, let's get ready. Let's get ready. What a celebration. That should just be ongoing. Hey, as Jesus gets a hold of your life, when you understand that he wants you to be baptized, as he says, here's the story of the gospel, let me show you. It's wonderful. Be ready for that. But I want you to think about this. The Greek people were struggling with it. That means if there's no resurrection, there's only death. There's life and there's death. That's just the news. That's just the news. I was thinking about this because this past weekend, a week ago, last weekend, there was this big gathering called the If Gathering. It's a big women's conference and it's done so well. It's led by Jenny Allen and uh, it was available on Right Now Media. You can still go to Right Now Media. If you don't have Right Now Media, let us know. We'll give you a free subscription. And then uh, you could go and say, oh, I want to watch it all. And I think there's now, after a week, they had to say, all right, now it's a, a, a price to, to watch the whole conference. But my wife was watching and listening to the If Gathering. And do you know this, that sometimes when somebody else is watching it, you can't help but watch it? When somebody else is listening to it, you, you're listening to it as well. Like, I don't have a choice. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm going to listen to it. And... Uh, the leader, Jenny Allen, was uh, talking with a pastor in Kiev, Ukraine. And he was sharing, he said, it's real. What's happening here is real. It's scary. So, but we're not leaving. These are our people. These are our, our friends and our neighbors. And this is why we're here. We have the good news to share and people are dying that's the news but people also are being saved and they're being changed until ultimately they're changed and he said this and it caught my attention he said it's very likely that myself my family my children will die he said it's very likely that we will be killed because we're not leaving we're staying and the situation is dire but we do not fear though we lose our lives because we know the truth of the gospel and this life is not all there is and so we serve jesus because he saved us and he's saving us and ultimately if we lose our lives here we will be saved Man, when I heard that, I was like, ah, oh, take away all the distractions of the world. Take away all the stuff that pull you in multiple uh, directions. And, oh, there it is. They get it. They get it because all of the facade has been stripped away. In fact, I want you to hear this. It really, when I, when I heard him speak, it made me think of these verses out of 2 Corinthians 5, 8, and 9. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That's what the pastor in Ukraine was saying. If, if we die here in Ukraine, we know where we're going. 
to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. I love that term, home with the Lord. So whether we are at home with him or away right here, we make it our aim to please him. What's the signature of Jesus? That each day we would want to please him until we stand in his presence. His presence is with us. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's with us until we are with him. And we make it our goal. What's your goal this week? What's your goal this week? Goal, goal. What, what are your key result areas? What are the things that you want to see happen? My goal for Monday is that I would please Jesus in everything I do. Now, by the way, let me share with you my goal for Tuesday. That I would please Jesus in everything I do. What's my goal for Wednesday? That we would please him. I love that. Just strip away all the distraction and talk about what matters. We have good news. I thought of this when I was able to visit a dear lady uh, who I've known since I moved to the valley. I was able to visit her a couple of years ago in the hospital. You know, you used to be able to go to the hospital and just like wing it out and go around wherever you wanted to go. I had a badge. And they're like, go ahead, go where you want to go. Do what you want to do. See who you want to see. That sounds like an 80s song. I went to a, visit this dear lady and I was come into her room because she was approaching the end of life and she was a fiery lady like yeah you know, she's always going to tell you what she's thinking whether you want to hear it or not and uh i came into the room and she said jason where does it say that the believers in jesus when we die we go to be with him right into his presence where does it say that again i can't remember it now here's what happens this is i don't know if this happens to you but it happens to me I can have it right here until you ask me it. And when you ask me it, I'm like, Grr. it's in the Bible. In the Bible. And I know it's in the second half. And I'm like doing the Rolodex, going through my mind, searching the database, trying to find out where it is. And she said, would you like to borrow my Bible? I said, oh, thank you. So she hands me her Bible and it's beautifully marked up all over the place. And she hands it to me. And we quickly find 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 8 and 9. And I read it to her out of the King James Version. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be absent from our bodies is to be present with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you that something happened as we read that verse together. That there was just a peace that came into that room. Peace that came over her because she was kind of hard to live with. Have you been around people like that? Kind of, she was just agitated that she had to be in the hospital. Like, I hate it here, you know, and... And she wanted to go home. She wanted to go home. But ultimately, there was a longing in her that she wanted to go home. And when we read these verses, I think the biblical word is she chilled. It was noticeable. It was noticeable to the nurses who came in and out of the room because she was much easier to work with. The gospel is powerful that way. When you understand it, it changes you and it changes you and it changes you until ultimately you're a change. How many times are you going to say that, Jason? Probably a couple more. So here's the signature of Jesus. Is the gospel. I want to remind you of the gospel. I want to remind you that this is written on the lives of every Christian, not just some Christians, not just amazing people like Billy Graham and Jenny Allen. It's not just some people. It's the signature of Jesus on the life of every Christian. What does that look like to the world? I can tell you. The world is a dark place. But when you have the peace of Jesus, when you have the hope of Jesus, when you have the understanding of what Jesus did, and that he's offering it to us freely. It makes you this bright light in the middle of a dark world. Christians should shine bright. Should shine bright wherever he's placed us. Let me give you just one last thing. Number three, the gospel can only be experienced by grace. By grace. So you say, well, what, why are you saying it that way? Why, what do you mean? That means you get no claim in it. You get no share in it that you did something, that you earned your way into the presence of the Savior, that you somehow had 5% and Jesus did 95%. That is heresy. 
That's wrong. Let me give you the definition for grace that has touched my life just repeatedly. Here's here's the definition for grace. An outrageous blessing given to totally undeserving people. I don't deserve this. I know. You don't deserve this. I know. It's this beautiful gift. Jesus gets all the credit. Jesus gets all the glory and we get none. Why do people want credit? Why do, there's this thing in us that is just at the core, pride. We want to say we did it. We earned it. We were part of it in this way. And Jesus is saying, when I said it is finished, we didn't go to the cross with him. He went to the cross. He went to the grave and he conquered it on our behalf. Now, I, I'm just going to tell you, my plan was to spend more time and just keep trucking in verses five through 11, where Paul says, I know that you need some evidence. And he begins to just say, let's go ahead through the evidence of the resurrection. These people saw him. These people interacted with him. It wasn't a hallucination. It wasn't a dream. Go ahead and understand it. Go ahead and study it. Go ahead and put it in the crosshairs. Go ahead and put it under the microscope. Go ahead and look at the resurrection of Jesus and see that the gospel is truly good news. I don't think we should be afraid of that, to let somebody just really, really go after it and dig in. Yeah. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at it together. See, what, what are we supposed to take away from today? The gospel is written across the life of every Christian. It's meant to be shared. It was shared with you. It could have been shared with you through something you were listening to or somebody who spoke to you. It could have been something you read, but the gospel was shared and you received it. And now we get to be the people that get to share it. And not just certain types of people, all Christians get to have the gospel and get to be a part of it. We're in it. We're part of the story now. The signature of Jesus is to reveal to the world who Jesus is and Share with them, this is what he did. And this is what he's doing. He's changing me. And he's changing me. And he's changing me until I'm ultimately changed. Only Jesus gets the credit. Glory to God alone. So we want to ask the Lord to help us. To just really imprint the gospel that we would understand it. That we would be reminded of it today. And that we would share it freely this week. Just in our natural, everyday lives. So I'm going to invite the worship team to just come. And I, I, I'm, you don't have to be surprised about what we're going to sing about. Here's the song we're going to sing. How deep is the Father's love for us. Put your name in there. How deep the Father loves. Put your name in there. That's the gospel. It's vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch undeserving his treasure as we sing that. Would you just stand where you're at? We're going to pray and then we're just going to go right into just celebrating in song. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you. We are so grateful for the reminder that the gospel is good news today. It was good news yesterday, and it will be good news tomorrow. I pray that we, as your people, would have it written across our lives, that we would remember how it was shared to us. I pray for anybody who doesn't know you, Jesus, today. Listen, if this is you and you don't know Jesus, simply, I would urge you to pray this. Jesus, I believe you. I believe that you are God and that you came for me. You lived a perfect life. I believe it. You died in my place on the cross. I believe it. You were buried for three days. I believe it. And you rose again to give me new life. I believe it. Now take away my sins and give me the eternal life that you offer. The forgiveness that you offer. Come and lead my life. Jesus, I want to follow you. If you know Jesus today, maybe you've known him for a long time. I pray that 
Just ask him to remind you of the gospel so it can be just fresh again. Lord, we love you. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing love the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory No.